Welcome back to EV News Daily. Coming up today, BMW tap Rimats for battery technology. The Mustang Mach-E for this model year adds range and performance, and the Hyundai Arnic 9, that's yet yeah, their three-row SUV, is seen in public. Plus, stay tuned, because later in the show, I'll tell you what Tesla is saying about how they're working to fix the Cybertruck's charging ability. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're listening around the world. EV News Daily is your trusted source of EV information for Wednesday, 10th of April. I'm Martin Lee, and I go through every EV story, so you don't have to. I'm here to save you time. And I've been doing it for over 2,000 episodes of this podcast in the archive. We're live at 5 p.m. It's midday Eastern. Uh, if you're watching us in the US, Patreon supporters get the episodes as soon as they're ready and ad free. Be like them by clicking on a link in the show notes. And if you are marking the end of Ramadan, as our, indeed our friends are this week, I won't see too much of them. They'll be with family and friends partying. I'm sure I wish you an Eid Mubarak filled with love and joy and success and prosperity. Oh, and of course, some delicious food as well. Let's start with news of EVs hitting new record highs in the biggest market for EVs, which is China. But this story can't possibly be true because all we're told these days is nobody wants to buy or drive EVs, that sales, the growth is faltering, it's slowing down, and that everyone's going back to driving petrol and diesel. Surely this must be made up. EVs in China hit a new record last month in March, a retail record of 41.6%. I'll pop that on screen for our YouTube viewers, uh, minus me in the bottom right-hand corner because I cover up part of the graph. Um, China passenger car sales hitting that new record last month. This is... Again, if you're watching the YouTube version of this, a, a, such a visual indication where we've come from over the last well, three or four years, really, post-pandemic, about how... EVs have taken off in China, and at some point I'll do the European version of this as well. They're flying, although there is some countries that are laggards, and again, this is this is counter to the US narrative that we're seeing a lot from US media, because they're following the lead of you know Ford and GM saying, oh, well, maybe we're not so sure, pulling back a little bit and slowing things down. In China, they are marching ahead so quickly. March saw a significant rebound in uh, EV sales. There, there has been a drop over the last couple of months, and it's why the monthly data is so difficult to look at with China, because or the Lunar New Year, it changes, holiday season changes, but you should really look at quarters to flatten things out. And But anyway, uh, March saw a retail sales of 709,000 EVs. That's a 30% increase from the previous year and a big increase from February. Sales figures exceeded the estimates that were out there and pure BEVs, i uh, put myself back on screen now that uh, you have seen the graph, um, pure BEVs are well over half of the total of what in China they call NEVs or new energy vehicles. And so, again, if you're thinking, well, is it all hybrids and stuff like that? It's about a 60-40 split in China. And, and this data continues to uh, show that it's about 60% BEV market and about 40%, that's under 40% actually, last, uh, last month in March of plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. And so counter to that narrative, which for some reason is gaining traction. I think there's lots of reasons why it's happening. Partly it's because it gets clicks and doom-mongering gets clicks and negative news gets clicks. Um, partly there's an anti-EV lobby out there. The oil industry and the fossil fuel industry, very, very powerful and spending huge amounts of money, whether that is in influencing journalists or whether that is just in their ad and marketing budgets and um, and the, the soft power that that wields. But looking at the data, looking at the world's biggest EV market, which is China, the growth story is absolutely there for EVs, and it's something that we'll certainly keep an eye on. Let's talk Ford and the 2024 year Mustang Mach E has a better range, faster charging. This car and drive report uh, giving us the details about some significant updates to the new rear motor, faster DC charging, and a revamped GT model as well. Plus, the new rally variant is added uh, with aero wheels and a big rear wing. The updated rear motor across all models aims to increase the vehicle's range and improve the torque as well with a lighter design. The select trim or the select model's range is 250 miles, that's 402 kilometers, with the standard battery and the single motor rear wheel drive configuration. 
go premium rear wheel drive with the extended range battery and you get 320 miles EPA. That's 515 kilometers of range, about a 20 mile increase on the outgoing model. Adjustments to the battery chemistry last year had already given us some improved ranges. Extended range battery models can now get to 80% charge, 10 to 80, I should say, 10 to 80 in 36 minutes. That's nine minutes faster than previous models. And the standard range battery will do it in 32 minutes. The GT Performance model merges into the main lineup, and so it's no longer a separate GT Performance model that you tick, but rather you add the performance upgrade package when you're specking your Mustang Mach-E, and it adds an additional 100 pound-feet of torque, previously 34 pound-feet of torque increase. Uh, the performance upgrade enables the Mach-E to accelerate 0 to 62 miles an hour, that's uh, just under a, uh, that's, sorry, 0 to 60 miles an hour, just under 100 kph, in 3.3 seconds and introduces some advanced powertrain thermal management as well. The GT model now includes Ford performance front seats, some Brembo front brake calipers, the Magneto dampers and standard features, and that's all uh, some of those features, the performance side of it, um, can be added, I think, afterwards as well. So if you don't go uh, the, uh, the route of getting the performance spec when you buy it, you can add those extra specs afterwards. I think it's a software update, so no additional hardware changes above going for the GT model. Pricing starts at 41890 for the select trim, so that gets you rear-wheel drive and standard battery. Uh, it's 45890 for the premium trim and 55890 for the GT model. It's about $1,000 for the performance upgrade, and if you want to go for that crazy bonkers rally model, uh, that's a bit just under $62,000. Link in the show notes for all of those specs. There's a bit of a, 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 a number drop there on you uh, if you want to find out more. All right, let's talk Tesla Cybertruck right now, and whether there's room for more inside the battery pack. I mean, physically room for more. And a teardown of the Cybertruck reveals its battery pack as substantial empty space in the battery, but is it enough for more cells? Well, we'll take a look again for my YouTube viewers. This was a week ago on the uh, the Munro social media X account, and I'm a bit behind on catching up with what Munro are doing. I've not watched their videos in a while, uh, so I must sit down and have a good old session. But this, like I say, uh, was about a week ago. Somebody asked me whether they thought I thought they could get more 4680 cells inside it. I didn't know what they're talking about, so I went and had a look. And so this is one that I missed. So maybe I'm the only one in the world that missed this. But if you didn't, uh, they posted a short video to their social media of them taking the top cover off, which, oh, incidentally, I'll pause it there. Looks like it was a little bit simpler than when they took the top cover or took the 4680 from the Model Y pack apart. But either way, right, I'll carry on. Um, and as you zoom into it, there is a significant air gap above those cells. It's the 4680 cells. Uh, interesting to look at. Oh, by the way, if you've watched the old Munro stuff, by the way, uh, and you know that from when they've torn down a, a battery pack before, uh, they they are often, or they have been encased in pink foam, like the pink foam of hell, uh, of just trying to get this pink foam, which is partly structural as well, I gather. Uh, but again, Tesla fans in the comments will know way more than me. I'm not a Tesla specialist, uh, but seeing Munro have to get all of that pink foam off last time was... Um, I guess amusing for those of us not doing it. Uh, but either way, uh, the foam is blue this time. They took the top, uh, top cover off like some sort of, you know, baby gender reveal. <laughs> oh, it's a boy. Congratulations. <laughs> you got blue this time. Uh, but when you when you see the cover come off, there is room above the cells. It's not packed tightly, but I don't think there's room for a second row. People asking me, look, is, is the Cybertruck going to have a, a second row of 4680 cells? Have they left room to come back and and add those in there no because you know that's that is 80 millimeters that's almost you know well 100 mil with extra room top and bottom um, is going to be four inches they're not four inches there to get it in i guess you could be designing physically the pack or you could be designing it for other cells like the byd blade battery or catl stuff i don't know uh I, it just could be an air gap that's needed. It could just be structural. Uh, it, I, I don't know, but it, there's not enough there for more 4680s. So no, I saw some excitement online. People saying, oh, are they going to uh, surprise us and just double the capacity overnight one day? No, I don't think they're going to do that. It's a pretty bad take uh, looking at this. There is some room. There's not loads of room, but I think it's interesting to, well, it's going to, I'm going to catch up on the Munro stuff and I have a look at what the Cybertruck looks like uh, with the pack taken off and when they have a go at getting rid of all that blue foam. 
staying with Tesla, and they plan to improve the Cybertruck's charging curve and battery charging ability, enhancing the fast charging capability by 20% with an over-the-air update coming. Initial testing of the Cybertruck's charge performance showed it peaking around 250 kilowatts, maybe a little bit more as well, but dropping down, as is the Tesla way, really, a quick wham-bam, thank you, ma'am, and then it pretty much falls off a cliff in some charge curves, depending on the age of the, the Tesla. But that's just the way that they, they do it. You hit a peak very quickly, then it will ramp down, uh, and it'll be 75 to 80 kilowatts, uh, around two-thirds state of charge in the Cybertruck. Tesla wants to sort that out soon with the, an over-the-air update. This is actually kind of a weird thing to see someone from Tesla who, it, by the way, I've got to say, I'm loving more people than just the CEO now on social media, now that he's kind of gone and done his social media thing, um, seeing lots more senior execs talking on behalf of Tesla. That was never the case years ago. You always had to rely on Mr. Musk. But uh, but now uh, this is uh, Drew Baglino, again, very senior person at Tesla. He's been there a very long time, actually, and overseen many of their projects. And now we see him on stage uh, doing presentations and things. So again, these are the super senior people allowed to comment on things. Uh, but uh, this was actually one of my friends, uh, Kyle from Out of Spec, who I do a Friday podcast with, have done for the last three years. Weird to see uh, him getting response. He drove the Cybertruck across the US did coast to coast and uh, and then Somebody else who knows what they're talking about, Brandon Flash, in the comments said that uh, they were, you know, multiple times they were hitting the power limit. Uh, well, Drew Bag Baglino responded to that uh, to say there was a corner case bug that locked it into 100 amp max when the Cybertruck was at a low state of charge. And given that Kyle turns up most of the time at 0%, uh, the corner case was reached quite a lot. But then further in the conversation, we got to well, the juice of what I'm talking about, I guess, um, which is that Tesla's energy and power train engineering lead actually said on social media that an update will come to increase the charging efficiency, offering 154 miles, that's about 250 kilometers of range, in 15 minutes, a big improvement from the current capability of adding 128 miles, or just over 200 kilometers, in the same duration. Uh, it's a 20% boost in charging speed, scheduled for release sometime this quarter. And uh, like I say, fantastic to see uh, senior people at Tesla being allowed uh, to uh, to to communicate with the community, and we we appreciate it very very much, and I'm sure Cybertruck owners will appreciate that speed bump coming soon as well. Now, yesterday I mentioned on the podcast about the prefabricated supercharger units. These are made in Gigafactory, New York, uh, shipped onto site, and they can have a supercharger station up and running in four days. Check out yesterday's podcast for that. Obviously, after all of the site permitting and power and all that is sorted out. So it's not four days to turn up and just get a supercharger bill. It's from when they arrive. And uh, and that is um, what they do with the prefabricated stuff. Very, very impressive. But again, a, a Twitter post that I found. I'm a couple of days late on this, uh, but it was one of the comments. You can check out the comment section of yesterday's video. Apologies, I haven't noted your name down. Uh, but thank you for putting me onto this, because uh, one of our listeners and viewers to the podcast pointed uh, this out to me. And that's Marco RP on Twitter. Um, saying that the world's newest, largest supercharger station is set to be located in Florida near exit 193 of the Florida Turnpike at Yeehaw Junction. Plans reveal the station will have 160 of these PSUs, these prefabricated supercharger units, and 40 of the standalone charging dispensers. I don't, I don't mean standalone as in they operate individually with no power sharing. Of course, they still will, but uh, they're not the prefab ones. Eight of the charging stalls are going to have pull-through capabilities, accommodating larger EVs, and for those people towing or the cyber trucks that are going to be towing trailers and things like that. So thank you very much in the comments. As always, I love it when the, the community of this podcast helps me out with the inevitable things that I miss. Thank you for that. Wow, 200 stalls at a Florida location. If so, if you're a Tesla owner, if you're a Ford owner, Rivian soon to be, you know, Polestar and Volvo adding that uh, ability to use the J3400 adapter and use the Tesla superchargers. This is just a huge bit of welcome news. Can we have one of those here, please? Let's move on and talk about the Hyundai Ioniq 6N version. This is going to be their high-performance version. Caught testing in some spy shots, which come to us courtesy of Autoblog today. Spy, spy photos surfacing, showing the Ioniq 6N prototype doing some Nürburgring testing, hinting at some upcoming high-performance action coming soon, featuring some large, sporty five-spoke wheels and some pretty serious brakes underneath there as well. Let me just make that picture a little bit bigger from 
Home Auto Blog uh, for our YouTube viewers. Nothing particularly visually on the outside for us to look at. We have some bigger wheels, some larger brake discs visible, some bigger brake calipers borrowed from the Arnic 5N. I would presume, I don't know. Uh, speculation would be that the Arnic 6N will have dual motors, probably a standard. There wouldn't be a tri-motor version, I wouldn't have thought, uh, but something around 641 horsepower and around 545 pound-feet of torque if it's going to be like its Arnic 5N sibling. Now, that, of course, was a different vehicle. The Arnic 5N wasn't just so a slightly quicker Arnic 5. That was more of a bespoke design. It has a wider track. It has some different aero stuff on the outside. It hasn't got the you know a big barn door on the back, but it's got some interesting aero stuff. And this picture that we can see online uh, right now, if my audio listeners, I'll just describe it. It's pretty much uh, an Arnic 6. Uh, there's nothing really visually. Uh, they've. Uh, it's going to have some wider rubber on because they've added. They have added some just little sort of. I don't know stick on uh, sort of wings uh, or just around the wheels uh, that are probably a little bit wider than the original ones. And so to meet regulations, because uh, you can't have the wheel sticking out further than the bodywork, there's some little sort of extra bits on there. But I think that is all going to be when you see the Arnic 6N, I would presume much more like the Arnic 5N, which is the N team at Hyundai going away and doing something a little more uh, bespoke, but we think more aggressive aero on this bigger front intake, uh, splitters, side skirts, rear diffuser, those kind of things, all about improving downforce and making it look ridiculous as well, like the Arnic 5N does. So they're not stopping at that. They are going to bring it to the Arnic 6 too. And now that it's testing, what's the timeline on that? Six to nine months away? I don't know. We'll wait and see. Okay, let's stay with Hyundai and talk Arnic 9. Getting a glimpse before its debut, Hyundai's first three-row electric SUV is now renamed the Arnic 9. I guess that matches Kia EV9. And let's see what Hyundai do with it. Now, we saw the concept, and I'll put this on screen for our YouTube viewers, our visual viewers, and I'll describe it for everybody else. Yeah, it's a, it's a large vehicle. The front is, I think, pretty conventional. No grille. It's just flat across the front, but they have lots of the little square lights that we see on the Arnic 5. So that is carried through, call it the, sort of the 8-bit style or 16-bit style if you want. Uh, that's carried through. The side profile certainly shows how the roof line doesn't dip down at the back and has pretty much a flat rear. I know that the Lee Auto Mega got quite a lot of criticism for having um, a similar style. That's the Chinese vehicle, of course, that you know, charges like 500 kilowatts on the right charger. And, and the styling got some criticism. This was just a you know, concept at the time from Hyundai. Uh, the, the side profile is a bit of a giveaway on that, and I'll pop on screen the rear, which is pretty much a flat rear. Uh, and again, lots of those little square lights that we see on the Arnic 5, but at the time it was called the 7, now it's called the 9, and then having a look at uh, the concept, the coach doors as well, that lounge feel, but certainly some sort of suicide doors, but the BMW i3 coach door styling, uh, that was the concept, so now we know what we're thinking about, and, and how much has the vehicle stayed you know, true to form or not true to form? Well, this is a YouTube channel uh, which goes by the name of Kindle Auto, uh, K-I-N-D-E-L. I don't know. I've had a look on this, this YouTube video uh, either for some attribution, for some copyright. Who filmed this? Uh, it's This channel is full of, of videos like this. And so if they shoot it all themselves, then, wow, they're busy. Uh, and maybe they do see these in California, or maybe it's the kind of account that just reposts other stuff that they find on the internet, which you shouldn't, you can't do. Um, I don't know, either way. So I'm not going to play the video. Um, I'm just, I'll show a couple of stills from it, but be very clear, I don't own the copyright on this, and this is, I'll give you where I found it, uh, but I don't know, they don't say whether they own these pictures or where, or where they came from, which is, you know, uh, you, you always should do. Uh, so we see the video here at a char the 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 car a charger, and uh, the the front lights seem to be the same, and the lights down the side and the front using those little uh, little squares that uh, that uh, that look of the Arnic Five is continued over. Another shot here with the front completely covered up this time, just enough lights uh, to uh, to I suppose be legal, I guess. Uh, and then the side profile, I would suggest is exactly the same as the concept. A very high roof line, but then a very, very straight back all the way down. Another quick another quick look at the rear lights. Looks like they carry over from the concept as well. And then a more of a, 
a, a side-on shot, uh, that profile view. And I would think it's going to come out very much like the concept, which let, re- let me remind you what it looks like again for our YouTube viewers. This is a very bold, a very bold concept. But I think by the looks of it, it's going to come out not a million miles away from what the vehicle was was originally shown. So that is very exciting. EGMP platform. And so, you know, we know it's going to have very decent charging speeds. We know it will uh, go into production sometime before summer this year for a US market launch uh, sometime at the beginning of 2025. Production slated for their new six, 7.6 billion EV plant in Georgia. So hopefully you would think for some specs of this vehicle eligible for the 7,500 $500 federal tax credit. But what will the rear be like? Will it be a lounge? Will it have that huge legroom of the sister car, the EV9, which is about 43 inches or 109 centimeters? Um, that is up. That's in Cadillac Escalade and Range Rover territory as well. And the Kia EV9, I think, is a, a is a bit of a sleeper hit. Actually, the more people catch on to the Kia EV9, those rear seats, those captain seats in the back that fold down. The rear room is exceptional, remotely controlled as well to fold them flat. They turn around, uh, do they turn around in the US ones as well as the European market ones? The rows two and three or row two can be turned 180 degrees to face the, the rear seats as well. It's a fantastic vehicle. They're heated and ventilated in the rear seats too. Look, it's it's a really nice place to be in the back of that. And I wonder what Hyundai will do with their version of it. But now we see it on the road in with camo, and it looks like it's going to be pretty close to that concept, which is, um, we'll say bold in terms of styling, but we'll wait to see the finished article. Talking of bold, that would be a massive car maker like BMW going to a relative newbie like Rimats and saying, help us out with battery technology. Of course, Rimats came from Mate Rimats converting his old BMW combustion car back in the day into electric power and taking it to events and showing off what EVs could do. And now look at what Rimats has done. And now we look at this agreement with BMW, which which surprised me when it, it, it landed in my inbox from the BMW press center because... It, it's a huge deal for Rimat. I don't know the financial side of the deal. They haven't disclosed that. But just the, the sheer fact that BMW going to who is what is relatively new to the automotive sector, and that's Rimat. Now, we know they're making incredible vehicles. We know that much. But this is Rimat's technology. That's the engineering arm of the Croatian EV maker. And they'll be supplying BMW with batteries for their Neuer class of vehicles. The collaboration is probably going to be the biggest thing that Rimat's has done to date for somebody else, uh, expanding their battery production capabilities at their automated plant near Zagreb, a big area of that devoted to making the cylindrical cells for BMW, who already make their, who already source their EV batteries from five global locations and expanding already with China, Hungary, Mexico, the US, and adding facilities in Germany, and now Croatia as well with this Rimats deal. I think it's a huge deal, by the way, uh, you know, for, for both, actually, because Rimats haven't missed a step, by the way. There's nothing that Rimats have done so far, which you go... Or they kind of got that a little bit wrong. Everything they've done has been brilliant, and 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 they haven't they, they haven't missed a beat yet. And so supplying this technology to BMW for their newer class of vehicles from 2025, the cylindrical cells moving away from prismatic, which are uh, 30% uh, offering an increasing range. They say of 30% and enhanced charging capabilities, lowering the weight of the vehicles as well. I'll pop a link in the show notes to the official release on the BMW Group website if you want to read more. Let's talk Lucid, and Lucid had a new record of deliveries yesterday, 1,967 of their Air models, according to this TechCrunch article, were delivered in the first quarter of 2024, the highest delivery to date, only by a few, but it still counts, right? But they just they just eke this one out. The company is increasing their efforts to attract more buyers through discounting with better marketing, I think, and introducing a, a new lower range, more accessible version of the Air model. Production of the Gravity will start sometime, we think, this summer. Uh, and that's uh, Lucid, you would think, relying a lot on that to propel them forward. Until then, their current strategy is discounting and getting the Air out there. Uh, they've also uh, have started to ship those vehicles partially built to Saudi Arabia for final assembly, part of the larger plan of, in, of uh, which involves selling uh, the last I read up to 100,000 vehicles for their principal shareholder and that Saudi investment. 
All right, next up, we'll go to California, where a U.S. appeals court has reaffirmed the EPA's decision to allow California to establish its own vehicle emissions and EV standards. Well, this ruling came after a challenge by 17 Republican states uh, and the fuel producers as well against the EPA's 2022 reinstatement of California's waiver. That's their waiver to set their own mandates that overturned a 2019 Trump revocation of that. Now, these contested regulations empower California to enforce their own zero emission sales requirements and tailpipe emissions, uh, which have much been criticised by some Republicans as undue regulatory advantages over other states. Historical context, uh, to put this into context for you, that includes EPA's initial waiver to California in 1993 for the first ever zero emission vehicle standard. In 2013, uh, the waiver uh, was also reinstated as well. And again a couple of years ago, like I say, uh, that was rescinded in the Trump era. The EPA's 2022 action allowed other states to adopt California's stringent tailpipe emissions standards, countering, again, that previous administration's uh, era ban on those being adopted. In a big move towards zero emissions, the California Air Resources Board, CARB, in August a couple of years ago, approved a plan to cease the sale of gasoline vehicles by 2035, in Introducing escalating annual requirements for zero emission vehicles, which start in 2026. And although the idea of a combustion ban, uh, that word freaks out some people, uh, whether that is Norway, whether that is the UK, Europe, all have different dates, California 2035. You've got to remember that Norway has been doing this for 10 years. Norway has 90% EV sales and only this year are they about to get 50-50 in terms of the car park that's out there. So in the all of the vehicles on the road in an, a small market like Norway, where the average car is owned, I think, for about 10.8 years. So there's an 11-year turnover. So even if you get to the point of Norway of almost 100% of all vehicles being EVs, you are then at least a decade away, at least there, from having those vehicles, those combustion cars coming off the road as well and going EV. So even if you talk about a 2035 ban, you're looking at 2045 or 2050 in many places before we're going all EV. That's nothing to be freaked out about, is it? Now, come on. Uh, However, when you look at it logically, it just makes sense to have these bans in place. It provides these businesses and companies uh, to make investment plans to bring zero emissions vehicles to market and know that there will be a market for them. Well, a Reuters report landed as I was sitting down to write today's podcast, which points out that China's EV exports are surging, and that's leading to an unprecedented increase in the orders for new car carrying ships, according to uh, Vison Nautical, is the source on this. China is projected to have the fourth largest fleet of car carriers by 2028. They're the eighth largest right now. China is becoming a big exporter of electric vehicles. We know that already. There's 33 car carrying ships ships in China's fleet right now. Japan leads, in case you're wondering. Just under 300 vehicles in Japan's fleet. Uh, South Korea, Norway have a load registered in those countries as well. But Chinese entities have placed orders for 47. 47 new car-carrying ships. That's 25% of all orders worldwide from the likes of BYD, SAIC, Cherry, and more as well. Uh, China has their uh, sights set firmly on being a major exporter of electric vehicles. They already, the increase in exports is already troubling uh, the Japan as the previous world's largest auto exporter. BYD, for instance, uh, exported more than 240,000 vehicles in 2023. About 8% of their total sales, the company wants to increase their exports to 400,000 this year alone, for instance. A link in the show notes if you'd like to read more. A quick mention for this story that points out China wants to increase their support for EVs and expanding globally, according to the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology. Now, this story taken from China.org.cn. So, usual health warning whenever we're talking about Chinese state media, uh, you're going to get their perspective on it, aren't you? Uh, But this move coming in response to the US launching their investigation into Chinese-made EVs and the European Commission 
emissions, customs registration, requirement for Chinese EV imports, probing into alleged unfair subsidies as well. Officials in China criticizing the actions of the US and the EU. You won't be surprised to hear. Uh, they, China say that there's lack of evidence and violating World Trade Organization, WTO, rules, arguing measures harm the global consumer market and disrupting the automotive supply chain. Like I say, that story coming from China.org. I mean, I don't know why I point these things out every time I do a story on China. I'll still get comments, won't I, saying, you are su- you are supporting the Chinese regime. How can you possibly do it? Why aren't you buying British? Why aren't I buying British? Tell me, what am I going to drive? A Nissan Leaf made in Sunderland or... A Nissan Leaf made in Sunderland. I, I know I drive a Polestar that's made in China. I know. And and I own an MG. <laughs> Shock horror. I'm basically on Xi's Christmas card list, aren't I? Come on. I mean, I get it. I understand the political issues around what we talk about with EVs and China and treatment of certain parts of the population. Let's not get into that, should we? Let's talk about cars. And let's talk about this story. Well, I found in the Financial Times and was utterly delighted to find that it wasn't behind the Financial Times paywall, which often things are. And uh, uh, and I think, well, I'd maybe, should, I, should I or shouldn't I be talking about this? because I want to respect other publishers' uh, stories and things like that. But this one was not behind their paywall, so I'm quite happy to tell you what the FT has been writing. And that is that European ports seem to be experiencing significant congestion, becoming makeshift car parks because of a slowdown in vehicle sales and logistical issues, including a shortage of truck drivers. Well, by the sounds of it, you want to see a big stack of EVs, just go to a European port and you'll find some parked up. A big factor in this congestion is the accumulation of Chinese EV imports. This article in the FT says some Chinese EVs have been sitting at ports for 18 months and you'd absolutely hope they haven't been because that is not going to be good for any EV battery to sit for however long at whatever state of charge. But 18 months, that's the claim in this article. Uh, Industry officials report difficulties in moving vehicles on once they get unloaded from ships because of the scarcity of truck drivers and the transport equipment. The glut is partly attributed to slower than anticipated sales of Chinese EVs, leading to extended storage at the port facilities. Uh, Now, one of those companies that manage the car terminals in Germany, BLG Logistics, uh, that's uh, Germany's second largest vehicle port, noting that the increased dwell time following the end of EV subsidies in Germany, for instance, has only increased since December last year. The congestion is emerging as the likes of BYD and Cherry and SAIC are all exporting vehicles to the European continent. The lack of available trucks, another one that has uh, another issue that's been raised and many people saying that they blame Tesla. Oh, what have Tesla done wrong now? They seem to get a kicking Uh, whatever they do. Uh, It turns out Tesla have been buying up all of the trucks and the movement of vehicles, and therefore the newcomers, the Chinese newcomers, they hey, we're going to sell some cars as well. Uh, Reportedly, they've all been reserved by Tesla, which adds to the logistical strain. Not Tesla's fault, is it really? Let's let's think about it. They got their ducks in a row and uh, can't really blame that one on Tesla. The backlog at ports is affecting the operations of car carrying ships with reported delays in Italian and Greek ports because of terminal congestion. So maybe all of these new ships that I talked about in the previous story, they're just, I don't know, they're just glorified car parks. They'll float around until they can find somewhere to put those vehicles. I jest, of course. Of course. I'll pop a link to the FT in the show notes if you'd like to read more. And that's your podcast for today. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Uh, thank you for supporting the podcast. Thank you for being a Patreon legend, if you are, by the way. Got some new names to add to the list this weekend. Uh, and thank you very much to everyone who's an existing supporter. You can be like them if you want to. At Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash EV News Daily. It's how I earn a living. How crazy is that? This is my job these days. People often say, hey, thanks for the hard work that you do on the podcast. Well, it's not that hard. And, you know, you can't really call this work. Either way, thanks to our premium partners, Porsche of the Village in Cincinnati, Audi of Cincinnati East, Volvo Cars of Cincinnati East, National Car Charging on the US mainland, and Aloha Charge in Hawaii, Derek Riley from Nevo.ie and the Nevo EV Review Island YouTube channel, Octopus Electroverse, global public charging made simple with one app and one map, and least plan electric moments, all the tools and guidance EV drivers need. Have a good and see you tomorrow. And remember, there is no such thing as a self-charging hybrid.